Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, none other than professor, author, intellectual extraordinaire Noam Chomsky on everything from Iraq to Ferguson to China and trade. And a sneak peek at a documentary on a worker's struggle that won. It's all coming up right here. Welcome to the show. It's hard to find anyone on the U.S. left who has not been influenced by our next guest. He's an accomplished linguist whose work has transformed his field. He's a political theorist and the author of more than 100 books, the subject of many movies. And he's not just a committed public intellectual, he's an activist. He shows up on campuses where the action is and draws a crowd. Noam Chomsky is our guest in this special interview recorded in New York. Noam, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. President Obama po picked the 10th anniversary of the U.S. Battle of Fallujah to announce a doubling of the U.S. troop presence in Iraq. Some of those troops going back to Ambar province, where Fallujah is situated. People talk about the crisis of ISIS, the lack of good options. Is this, a, what, is this how you see it? It's interesting to look at it carefully. Fallujah, first of all, was one of the worst atrocities of the 21st century. Uh, the Iraq war itself was the worst crime of the 21st century, easily. Fallujah was probably the worst war crime carried out during that war. The Marines, uh, six, 7,000 Marines attacked Fallujah, uh, probably killed everyone who was there. They called them insurgents, but whatever that means. Uh, the uh, first day of the invasion of Fallujah, you take a look at the New York Times, had a front page photograph of uh, Marines breaking into the General Hospital, which is a war crime, uh, throwing all the patients on the floor and shackling them, uh, throwing the doctors on the floor. It was hailed as a triumph. Yeah. When the high command was asked why they broke into the hospital, they had an explanation. They said it was a propaganda center for the insurgents. It was releasing casualty figures, and therefore it's legitimate to carry out a major war crime. Uh, the uh, pr apparently pretty exotic weapons were used there, and there's evidence which international agencies don't want to look at of uh, high levels of cancer, uh, uh, other effects of uh, maybe depleted uranium, maybe something else. It's a major atrocity, so, but it's hailed here as a victory. The only way it is referred to now is as a tragedy because the Marines fought so hard to liberate Fallujah, and now ISIS is in control of it. I mean, you don't know what to say. So what would you do if you were president? If ISIS? First of all, ISIS is a monstrosity. There isn't a conceivable way of dealing it. It's kind of hard to imagine uh, following the law. I say that cautiously because it's such an outrageous idea. Uh, but there are laws and uh, we're bound by them. They're actually, the Constitution requires that we adhere to them. Of course, we never do. Uh, one of them is, that, uh, is the UN Charter. Uh, a way of dealing with ISIS following the law would be to approach the Security Council, uh, insist, request that they declare a threat to peace, which of course they would do, and uh, organize a way to respond to it, and then follow the will of the international community. Uh, out of that, there might come a reasonable response. Uh, the unilateral U.S. response, namely hit everything with a sledgehammer, uh, makes absolutely no sense. Uh, the correspondent who's followed this most closely and has been right all along, Patrick Coburn, uh, simply describes it as an Alice in Wonderland strategy. Uh, the, the major ground forces that are fighting ISIS are apparently the PKK uh, and its allies in Syria, uh, the civil group. Uh, they're barred because we call them a terrorist group. So they're under attack. Our ally Turkey attacks them and we bar them support. But they're apparently the ones who saved the Yazidi and blocked the ISIS 
attack on Iraqi Kurdistan, so they're out. Uh, the major regional force state that could confront ISIS is Iran. In fact, they could probably wipe them out. And uh, they're influential in Iraq. In fact, they were the victors of the Iraq war. They're out for ideological reasons. A uh, more complex case, actually, which Patrick Coburn's talked about, is uh, what to do with Assad. The, and that has all kind of complexities, but uh, anyway, they're out. He's talked about so, it on this program. And, and the sledgehammer has its usual effect. The uh, bombings, the U.S. bombings, are in the usual and predictable way, eliciting uh, anger from the civilians who are under attack. They don't like ISIS, they hate it, but they don't want to be attacked by American bombs. This, this is a perfect design for a kind of failure, though not necessarily a failure for the United States. It would be a failure for the people of the region. There was a very interesting uh, uh, ins insight into this in the New York Times maybe a week ago. The lead article uh, should have had the headline, the United States declares itself to be the world's leading terror state and is proud of it. That was the content of the article. Of course, it didn't have that headline. But it was very revealing, also the lack of response to it. Uh, what it, it, it the report is the lead story. It said uh, it was a report of a CIA study that had just come out uh, of uh, U.S. interventions. Uh, and the study was concerned with uh, when they worked and when they didn't work and why. And they quoted Obama as saying that he'd commissioned some such studies. He was kind of disappointed that they didn't work so much. Then you take a look at the examples. First paragraph of the story, three examples. Cuba, Angola, Nicaragua. Each one a major terrorist war carried out by the United States. Not even ambiguous. So here we take three major terrorist wars, horrible consequences. Uh, we investigate, did they work, or didn't they work? We're disappointed that they didn't work. Uh, and the president says, well, we have to find better ways. I mean, again, the headline should be, yes, we declare ourselves to be the world's leading terrorist state. We're proud of it. It goes to a much bigger question. You talk often, as you just did, about the conventional wisdom being reality on its head. That goes back to the founding story of the United States. Sure it does. Can you talk about the principles on which this country is supposedly founded versus the ones you think they might actually be founded on? I've been reading Edward Baptist's extraordinary book. Well, take Baptist's book and uh, compare it with the New York Times this morning. Uh, there's a description in the New York Times of the horrible treatment of the Yazidi uh, by ISIS. Now go back to Baptist's book. That's what he's describing. He's describing the treatment of the slaves for half of American history, and in fact it continues, and it's almost identical. That's the way they were treated. That's part of our, and as he points out, uh, Amer it's not just uh, you know, kind of bad people in Georgia. Uh, North uh, Boston financiers were involved in it. Uh, they were, you know, they, they didn't say they're in favor of slavery, but they were happy to become wealthy by uh, exporting and in commodities that were produced by the leading, uh, 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 the leading resource of the 19th century, which was cotton. Cotton was kind of like oil. So the oil, you know, the cotton gets exported, they make a ton of money in the banks, uh, they have enough money to import, the country grows and becomes rich, and in fact, as Baptist says, the economy was built on the backs of African slaves. So is capitalism, as you call it, wrecked, um, real existing capitalist democracy in the United States, redeemable, reformable? Well, this is a good illustration of how remote our system is from capitalism. It's hard to think of any greater violation of capitalist and market principles than slavery. But the country was based on two basic con uh, commitments. One, slavery, which was, as Baptist points out, of the sort, pretty much the source of the growing economy, including the industrial economy. The other is extermination of the indigenous population by state power. Now, what's that got to do with capitalism? 
And in fact, it goes right to the present. So if you have an iPhone and you take a look at the components in it, and practically all of them were developed through the, through the state sector. Uh, government funding, you know, research and development, often for decades. Public uh, sector, we paid for it. Yeah, we pay for it. And uh, notice there is a principle of capitalism. If you say we imagine, imagine we're in a capitalist society and you invest money in something, and it's a risky investment, uh, and, it go, and you keep investing in it for decades, and finally, uh, something comes out that makes a profit. Well, in a capitalist society, you're supposed to get the profit. That's not what happens here. If I'm the, Ameri if I'm the U.S. taxpayer? You pay for decades, uh, under, usually under the pretext uh, that the Russians are coming or something. You're paying for the kind of research and development and creative work that leads, that yields the IT revolution, uh, computers, the internet, uh, your iPhone, all the rest of it. Do you get any, anything back? Haven't noticed it. Haven't noticed it. Goes <laughs> Not to even Steve jobs. Jobs and Bill Gates. But we work a lot with people these days who are interested in trying to develop worker own co ops and cooperative regions of solidarity economics. Is that hopeless? No, I think that makes sense. In fact, there are interesting things happening. Uh, the person who's done most of the writing about this is Garl Perovitz. It's interesting work. Uh, throughout uh, the northern Middle West, like Ohio, northern Ohio, uh, there is a spread of uh, worker-owned uh, uh, enterprises, not huge, but not small either. Uh, which uh, could be the basis of a different kind of society. And notice that these could be substantial if there was enough popular support. So go back a couple of years. Uh, Obama virtually nationalized the auto industry. Uh, it was collapsing, so it had to be kind of bailed out by the taxpayer, usual story. So he took over most of the auto industry. There were a few possibilities. One possibility, of course, was the one that was followed. Bail out the owners, bail out the banks, uh, give it back to the same people or other people, different faces, but the same, essentially the same roles in society, and have it continue to produce what it had always been producing, automobiles. There was another possibility. Give it to the workforce, uh, let subsidize them to develop it, uh, have it produce what we need. So what do we need? I can give you a personal example. Uh, my wife and I came into New York by uh, train from Boston. Uh, the train took only an hour and a half longer than when I took it in 1950 uh, for the first time. Either it was standing still or it was going slower than the trucks on the Connecticut Turnpike. I mean, there isn't a country in the world where this happens. Uh, and that's just a symbol of the country. Yeah. This is the richest country in the world, has incomparable advantages, and it's just falling apart. Were you encouraged by the news that was hailed as a breakthrough of the U.S.-China accord around emissions, for the first time China committing to cap emissions? Well, it's not the first time they'd already committed to it. I mean, there's a little adjustment in the dates. Look, it's better than nothing, but it doesn't really amount to much, and it has potential dangers that we ought to keep our eye on. Notice that this is a U.S.-China agreement. It could turn out that this is going to undercut the international agreements, and it's not impossible that that was the purpose. Uh, when we talk about Chinese emissions, remember, they're our emissions. Uh, China's manufacturers say your iPad and there's pollution, but that's for the American market. Uh, so the, it's a mixed story. Well, so that goes to the questions that we received from our Facebook friends. We invited them to pose questions of Professor Chomsky, and, and they posed very many. They fell into several camps. How did we get into this mess? How would you describe this mess? And how do we get out of this mess? I think we're at the how do you describe this mess um, situation. One per question in particular was, how do you assess the strengths and weaknesses of um, the U.S. movements for social justice? And how would you advise we try to maximize the strengths and minimize the other? Well, since the, um, the, the labor movement has traditionally been in the forefront of uh, progressive social change, and 
for that reason and others, it's under severe attack. And by now, it, it, partly for it's because partly it's the fault of labor bureaucrats, but partly it's just a fierce attack from the uh, business world, which pretty much runs the country. And by now, the uh, labor movement is a shadow of it, what it once was. Uh, it could come back. There have been earlier periods of American history when labor was destroyed. Uh, 1920s, it was practically wiped out. 1930s, it rose again. Could happen. But the, with the labor movement very seriously weakened and uh, independent political parties almost gone, uh, there's a lack of, uh, it's a fundamental lack of continuity in activist politics. So everything starts from yeah. an, as if nothing ever happened before. So you have to take Occupy, which was important, but it came out of nowhere. No institutional memory, you know, uh, no recollection of the history, uh, uh, not even remembering how to run a demonstration. You know, all of this kind of institutional memory is gone. There's a lot of activism, but it's very separated. I mean, one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing is just giving talks around the country. And one of the major uh, positive contributions is it just brings people together yeah. in the same community, uh, people who may be doing the same thing in different neighborhoods and don't know each other. Uh, and that extends you know, across the country, what's happening here and nobody knows about there. Uh, that's a serious weakness. One of the other questions we had from our Facebook uh, page was from people asking about the prospects for a movement growing out of the conflict in Ferguson and the role of police and the militarization of our police in our society. Do you see any prospects for a broad anti-racist social justice movement coming out of that mobilization? There are prospects, but it's going to be very hard. This is a very racist society. I mean, it's pretty shocking. Uh, and uh, what has happened in the last roughly 30 years with regard to African Americans actually is very similar to what Baptist describes in the late 19th century. Uh, remember what happened. Uh, this, the constitutional amendments after the, during and after the Civil War were supposed to free uh, African American slaves. It, did something for about 10 years. Then there was a North-South Compact, which essentially granted the, the former slave-owning states the right to do whatever they wanted. And what they did was criminalize black life in all kinds of ways. Now that created a kind of a slave force. In fact, one of the most interesting books on it, Douglas Blackman's, is called uh, Worse Than Slavery or something like that. Uh, it threw most, mostly black males, but also women, into jail, uh, where they become a perfect labor force, much better than slaves. If you're a slave owner, you have to pay, for, you have to keep your capital alive. If the state does it for you, it's terrific. Uh, no strikes, no disobedience, uh, perfect labor force. A lot of the American Industrial Revolution in the late 19th, early 20th century is based on that. Actually, it pretty much lasted until the Second World War, when uh, there was a need for what's called free labor in the war industry. After that come about two, two decades in which African Americans had a kind of a shot at entering the society. Uh, a black worker get a job in an auto plant, the unions were still functioning, maybe buy a small house, uh, send his kid to college or something. By the 1970s or 80s, it's going back to criminalization of black life. It's called the drug war, which is a racist war. Ronald Reagan was an extreme racist, didn't hide it. And the whole drug war, so-called, is designed from policing up to you know, eventual release from prison uh, to make it impossible for the uh, black male community and more and more women and more and more Hispanics, Hispanics to be part of the society. In fact, if you, if you look at American history, the first slaves came in 1619. And that's half a millennium. There have been about three or four decades in which African Americans had a limited degree of freedom. You know, not entirely, but at least some. Now, of course, it's 
for, for black elites, there's some privileges, but I'm talking about the mass of the population, which is being, which has been uh, recriminalized and incidentally also turned into a slave labor force. There's prison labor, for example. Well, this is American history. To break out of that is no small trick. Yeah. In fact, if you take a look at the election, say the last election, uh, in many ways it's a civil war. Uh, the red states of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. It extends a little beyond, but that's pretty much what it is. Yeah. And of course, uh, uh, this is a real battle. I mean, uh, 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 the, these two founding crimes, slavery and extermination of the indigenous population, they're very much with us. Take a look at Indian reservations today. Yeah. It's not a pretty sight. People could talk a lot about what to do, but I do have to ask you one other important question that came out of Democracy Now! yesterday. I don't know whether you heard, but um, rumors were spread of unseemly behavior by yourself at summer camp with Amy Goodman's father. I read it. I didn't read it. Somebody sent it to me. Russell Brand, the British actor <laughs> comedian, wants to know, did you bite Amy Goodman's father's ear? Afraid not. He was a friend. We were... Uh, we were um, a, a campers at a camp, and we were in the same bunk, and we were friends. We knew each other for a couple of years, but never got as close as biting his ear, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, thank you so much. It's great yeah. to have you. Yeah. Estás a la mitad del río y estás viendo México y estás viendo Estados Unidos. Y dices, wow, pero yo qué tengo que estar haciendo aquí? Ya llegas acá, te instalas y ves la verdadera situación de cómo es que se ganan los dólares, ¿no? Decidimos llamar al departamento de labores a reportar todo lo que estaba sucediendo, pero ellos jamás llegaron. Somos indocumentados. Pero eso no quiere decir que tengan que lucrar con el hambre de nosotros. Cuando tenemos un contacto con el trabajador, somos muy explícitos. Estamos hablando de una lucha de poder. Dijeron que este, cómo nos iban a dar los beneficios si nosotros no éramos ni siquiera una unión. So, ok, so, ahora van a tener su unión que ellos pedían. You never have more power than that as a worker in this country. He has to negotiate with you. Hoy que ganamos, que tenemos la unión, ¿por qué ahora la compañía tiene que cerrar? I mean, what happens when you have a group of workers who do everything by the book, and then the boss just finds a way to screw them over anyway? Cuando veo las noticias de que están ocupando el parque, digo, oh, están locos, ¿qué están haciendo ahí? Mama told me that he had Occupy Wall Street helping him out, and I'm afraid that he might get deported. These workers are undocumented; they can lose everything. They should be leading the struggle, and we should be taking their lead. Is my point. Not a bunch of kids. Nosotros podemos poner una campaña y que se ocupe el lugar de trabajo. O sea, no podemos estar cuatro o cinco años dando flyers, ¿no? We're supposed to be invisible. The food's supposed to arrive, but you're not supposed to see them. We've been disrespected. We've been belittled. They feel like we are not better than 725, but we definitely are. We need to stand behind each other. The middle class is evaporating. They're going against somebody who's trying to own something nice so that they can live well. It's horrible what's happening to business owners in this city. You want to get rich? Go to work. Don't take a day off. At this moment in the picket line, the morale of the workers are down. This one is about finding the right strategy that makes us to win. Si vas a abusar de mis derechos, te vas a tener que atender a las consecuencias, porque ya no somos las mismas personas con los ojos cerrados de antes, ¿no?
the people running these, uh, you know, running empire at this point speak exclusively in the language of violence and force. We have been brutalizing these people for over a decade. And we have decapitated through our drones, our aircraft, our missiles, far more people, including children, than ISIS has ever decapitated. And when you brutalize people to that extent, they become brutal. The center of gravity of the movement was grassroots organizing, was frontline communities, was alliances between um, communities of color, indigenous communities, working class white folks. Like, you saw a different face of the movement. We see this as a growing movement around systems change, not climate change.